Here now the reading from Matthew's Gospel, the 25th chapter, beginning at the 14th verse. Jesus speaks to his disciples. For it is as if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had two talents made two more talents. <clears throat> but the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made you five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went, and I hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was mine plus interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have in abundance. But from those who have not, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God shall stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that we might be the masters of ourselves to become the servants of others. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for thee. Amen. Many of you would know the name James Mishner. James Mishner was the author of more than 40 novels, most of them those epic and kind of sweeping stories of families in some geographic locale, South Pacific, Alaska, Hawaii. Those were kind of Mishner's stock and trade as novels. He won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction in 1948, and he died in 1998. But you may not know the story of how James Mishner came to be a writer in the first place. Uh, the story is, actually, his motivation to become a full-time novelist came in response to a near-death experience that changed his life, or at least changed the way he thought about life, which is life-changing in its own, I guess. For years, the story is, uh, in his young adulthood, uh, Mishner dreamed of being a novelist, but his standard pattern when he thought about doing that was to shrink back from the idea. It's too risky. Uh, nobody will want to read what I write. I don't want to leave my safe and secure day job. He worked for the Navy as a journalist uh, for a, a, a Navy newspaper, as a correspondent for a, a, journal, uh, a Navy journal employed by the government. It's a safe job. I don't want to leave that and take the plunge into you know, the world of struggling writer. So that was sort of the, the internal conversation for his early adulthood, but it changed when one day in his Navy job, he was returning from a routine assignment as a reporter, and in bad weather, 
uh, near uh, the, the base off of the, uh, in the Fijian Islands in the South Pacific. The plane was coming in for a landing. It was bad weather, and the pilot kind of, either a gust caught the plane at just the wrong time or the pilot miscalculated, and they crashed, crash landed, skidded off the runway. The, the plane somersaulted three or four times. Uh, two people on the plane were killed, and many were injured. Uh, a missioner uh, walked away. Um, he, he was amazed that he was unhurt. He was, when he got home, after being checked out at the hospital and deemed okay, uh, he said, I went to my quarters and I just sat silently in my living room for the longest time. And then he went over to his diary and he wrote this. I am going to live the rest of my life as if I were a great man. I'm going to concentrate my life on the biggest ideals and dreams that I can handle. And then the story is that the very next day, he submitted his resignation to the Navy, and he put a sheet of paper in the typewriter, and he got to work on South Pacific. Uh, that was Missioner's story, and, and I thought of it today on, on what is essentially the last Sunday of the church liturgical calendar. Next week is the first Sunday of Advent. That's the new year for the church. This is the, this is kind of New Year's Eve, the last day of the year for church, and I thought it's a perfect day to think about time. Uh, we've called it, we gave it our own name this year, Gift of Time Sunday. And behind uh, what I've got in mind today is the idea that, like James Missioner, all of us are called to, to make our time count, uh, to see our days, ordinary though they may seem to us as they come one, one at a time, to see them as a gift, which is exactly what they are, and, and to see them with a view toward getting up every morning with some of that same resolve of James Missioner. I'm gonna, I want to live as a great man or a great woman. I want to be a great soul. Uh, the church has long cultivated a reverence for our time in that way. One of my favorite psalms is the 90th Psalm. It, it, partly I like it because it's so realistic. It, it, the, in the 90th Psalm, there is a, a very blunt assessment of, of the fact that all of us, uh, we have a finite number of years on this earth. You know, the years of our life, the psalmist writes, are three score and ten, or, or even if we are strong, four score, yet they are soon gone, and we fly away. The psalmist says, our time is limited on this earth, but for him, that's not cause for despair. It's actually just a prescription to remember how valuable your days are. The psalm ends not with a whimper about the fact that we all are eventually going to die, but with this kind of wonderful uh, uh, invitation. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Make your days count. Don't hold back living a life uh, that, that uh, you know, someday down the road, I'll get to living as a great soul. Someday down the road, I'll, I will demonstrate the values that I would like to have characterize my life as a whole. Uh, the psalmist, and, and I think it, generally, the wisdom of the church has been a great, a life well lived is really the sum total of individual days well lived. And so all of us have a calling every day to, to express in our actions, our attitudes, our behavior, the values which we would like to have characterize our life as a whole. Would you like to be known as a generous person when all is said and done? Well, today's your day to be generous. Would you like to be known as somebody who is empathetic or somebody who was a lifelong learner or somebody who encouraged others? Today's our day uh, in one way or another to demonstrate those values. A life well lived is really the sum total of individual days well lived. Time is God's gift to you to be preciously handled and, and, and used well and to the full. Something like that, of course, is behind that wonderful parable of the talents. In, in the parable I just read you, there are three characters, of course, but the real focus, I think, it, and, and the most is said about the one talent man, you know, the guy who buried his gift in the ground and got taken to task because he was too cautious. Uh, the one talent man in the story, uh, God bless him, you know, he's the patron saint of everybody who has been tempted to do something good or bold but uh, decided it would be best to play it safe and then later regretted it. Have you ever had that experience? I, I, occasionally, I think it happens to all of us. And it's interesting to think that Jesus told this story, uh, the, the, the parable of the talents, it comes actually 
right in the midst of a time when Jesus is making his own personal high-risk decision. Uh, the, the location of the parable, the end of Matthew's gospel, it happens, uh, or it occurs in Matthew, just after Jesus announces that he has made his choice to leave Galilee with his disciples, where he is known and where he is liked and where it's comfortable for him, and he has decided, I'm now going to go to the big city, Jerusalem, uh, where the, he knows their, uh, their, the religious authorities already have it out for him. He knows that's their center. There's going to be conflict with them, and ultimately that will spin out into that conflict uh, with Pontius Pilate that takes him to the cross. So Jesus is in the middle of having just made his own risky choice in order to be true to his best values and his highest calling when he tells this parable. The kingdom of God, he said, is like a wealthy man who goes away on a long journey. And before he goes, he distributes his property to his slaves. To one, he gives five talents. Incidentally, a talent, a huge sum of money in biblical times. A talent was worth about 6,000 denarii, a, a denarii being a day's wage for a common laborer. So, you know, it's a, one talent is 15 years' pay for a day laborer. To one, he gets five talents, to another, two, and to a third, one. And then, of course, you know how the rest of it goes. The first, the, the five talent man uh, takes his big portfolio and, and invests in some venture that's risky enough that it quickly doubles his money. Second slave does the same thing. And, and when the master returns, he is pleased. Well done good and faithful service. Enter into the joy of your master. Isn't that a great phrase? Enter into the joy of your master. Um, but when we get to the third slave, the, the story slows down, and we get all this detail. The, the one-talent guy has buried his God-given gift in a hole, and when he's called to account, he can pr produce it back. He gives back the check. It's uncashed, and he gives an explanation for why he's done nothing with it. I knew you were a hard man, and I was afraid. Here, you have what is yours. Every penny you gave me, I give it back to you. And notice, in, in a sense, he's not a bad man. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I've occasionally, when it comes to investing, there have been times when I've bought some th investments that later on I would have been really happy if I could have just got my check back, you know, uncashed. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a classic example of somebody who tends to, you know, buy high and sell low. Uh, but uh, he's, he's, safety has been his priority, right? I, you, you can have it back. Uh, and, and he must have been shocked, the one talent man, cautious that he was for the, the harsh response that generates from the master. You wicked and lazy slave. If I had wanted my money buried in the ground, I'd have done it myself. Now give it to the one with 10 talents and get off my property. People who study parables, uh, they, they agree that most of Jesus' parables tend to have one overarching single point. And if you were going to come up with the point here, it's pretty easy. It's not about money at all, but about what the master expects of followers to do while he's away. And, and it's pretty clear, when it comes to our place in the kingdom of God, the greatest risk, it turns out, is to not risk anything. That's the greatest risk. Just let your earthly years go by. Don't take a chance. Don't give your heart away. The greatest risk, according to this parable, is not to risk. You know, you, you know the, uh, what, what do they call that, the second law of thermodynamics, the use it or, or lose it law that, that uh, scientists talk about, uh, the law of entropy. Uh, it applies spiritually as it does to any, you know the law of entropy. That is, any system that is left to itself without a new infusion of energy will start to deteriorate. It will start to go to greater randomness or fall apart. Uh, I've had people tell me, uh, you, you, you'll learn the truth of the law of, second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy, if you have a vacation house uh, or a cabin up in the woods. People will say, it's amazing to me, I leave my cabin up in Wisconsin in the fall and I've got every, I, I've drained the, the pipes and I've shut the furnace off and I've tightened everything up and it's all clean as a pin and I come back down and the next spring when I go, the faucet that didn't leak when I left, it's now leaking, and, and the, there's a crack in, 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 the, in the plaster. How did that happen? And, and he said, all, things left to themselves without a new infusion of energy, they deteriorate. And, and, and it's uh, spiritually, 
the same thing, I guess. That's one piece of the puzzle as to why Jesus is so hard on the one talent person. Your, your life is given to infuse the, the world with life. Uh, you, you, you can't hold back. And the other aspect of the parable that I find compelling is, is the clear point, or the implication, I guess. Sometimes what's implied is as important as what's said. And Jesus makes it pretty clear in what's said is that not everybody gets treated the same in life. Not everybody's dealt the same hand. Somebody gets five talents, some two, some get one. But what matters to the master is not the hand you're dealt, but how you play the cards, the, the choices you make in what you do with what you have. In, in the parable, everybody's different in what their, you know, their level of responsibility, uh, but none of the three uh, who, who receive talents are told what to do. They, they all have to choose, and it's in the choosing that things went well, or, or in one case, badly. Uh, Rollo May, the famous psychologist, wrote a good book years ago called The Courage to Create, and in that book he said, acorns become oak trees and kittens become cats, wholly by instinct, imprinted on their DNA. But, May said, a man or woman becomes fully human only by our choices. It's our choices that separate us from the rest of creation. And that dimension of choice and commitment, I think it's at the heart of the parable. And it's going to be at the heart of our closing act of worship today. A chance, if you would like, to walk to the cross, not, not this time with the financial commitment, but with a symbolic gift of your gifts, your time, uh, for the work of the church for the coming year. You, in, in those forms that we sent out, you see all sorts of opportunities and needs the church looks to you as its members for, a, a, if we're to lead as a, as a community that makes and nurtures disciples through 2018. We are so grateful for all of the ways, the, 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 the preparers of funeral dinners and the clearers of sidewalks and the waterers of plants and the uh, builders of habitat houses. And I can go on and on and on and on. Uh, the, the, the need, we, are, we are collectively those who deploy our gifts for the service of making and nurturing disciples. And how rich we are as a church and how strong we become when each of us catches the vision of the future God is bringing into being through us as a community of faith. It's a little like that boy with the loaves and fishes, you know. God does this wonderful uh, multiplying, feeding 5,000, but he doesn't do it out of nothing. He takes a little bit to get things started. And all of us are called to offer the, the loaves and fishes that we have for the miracle that God wants to bring into being. In that wonderful story, you know, the implication is if the boy had held back that day, what he had, you know, the, the five loaves, would anybody have gotten fed? It wasn't done out of nothing. It was done out of a gift. And I think the implication is, you know, if I hold back what little I have in terms of my skills and you hold back what little you have, the channels of grace get blocked. That's the bad news. But the good news is that the opposite's also true. When I give what I can do, you do what you can do, God is there to bless it and to multiply it. Whether our talents be many or few, I hope you'll come forward today with a symbolic gift that represents a real gift, your time, freely given as part of our commitment to be God's community of faith here in Bloomington uh, as we then go out to act on that belief that there really is an unquenchable spark of God's power and God's love in every one of us, and there really is a niche that only you can fill. Amen.